Well, greetings, Imagination Connoisseurs. Once again, it is I, your Duke of Dope Discourse, your ma- I didn't know what to do with my hands there, your master of fun and wonder, your viceroy of verisimilitude, and John Campia calls me your existential Mr. Rogers. That's right, Robert Meyer Burnett, and this is the John Campia Show Mailbag for Friday, June 3rd, 2022, rolling towards the summer with you. Now, remember, on the John Campia Show, every day, live Monday through Friday, we will answer your super chats, your live questions, only only open for a couple of minutes. But any time other than that, seven days a week, day or night, our operators are standing by. You can go to the link right down there in the description. You can send us a comment, a review, a question, whatever. And if we deem it appropriate, we will read it right here on the mailbag. So make it good, people. Come on, it's Friday. I could be home now. Make this mailbag good. Let's start this show. Uh, Air Gen A says, hey, John or Rob. Well, it's Rob. You've got me. Hope that's okay. I've really been loving the Obi-Wan show so far. If I had one major complaint, though, it would be that the music in important scenes just seems a little off to me. Do you agree? Thanks for everything you and the show does. Arjan, I got to tell you, you're not wrong. I mean, I think one of the things that we all associate with Star Wars is the music, I mean, whether it's Michael Giacchino in Rogue One, who is drawing heavily from John Williams scores, uh, John Williams themes are are just as indelible to Star Wars as Vader, Luke, Han, R2, 3PO, even Ray or Kylo Ren. I can't imagine Star Wars without them, but you know when you have to? While you're watching Obi-Wan. Obviously, John Williams came back and wrote a great theme. I thought it's great for Obi-Wan Kenobi, but we don't have enough of those themes. I mean, I I agree, and I think that's maybe, you know, I, I have said that sometimes the show lacks narrative thrust for me. I think some of that has to do with the lack of those great Star Wars themes that, you know, you, you hear a couple of notes and you know what they are. Um, and we, we're not getting that in the show, and I think that's kind of a mistake. But then on the other hand, how many people are John Williams? So, but I think you're not wrong uh, Jerome, do you think stories like X-Men that use non-human characters as an allegory for oppressed groups contradict their own message with the fact that humans are not entirely wrong in their hatred or fear when mutants literally can destroy the world? Um, that is an interesting question. And obviously the X-Men, you've got the philosophy of Charles Xavier and the philosophy of Magneto. And Magneto believed that Homo Superior should inherit the Earth because of the way mutants have been treated by Homo sapiens since the dawn of time. I don't think he's necessarily wrong. I mean, if you read the old X-Men graphic novel, God Loves, Man Kills, from the early 80s, incredible, incredible book. Um, But I mean, here's the thing. Just because something is allegorical doesn't mean it's necessarily working in absolutes. So the the battle between Xavier, who believes in peaceful coexistence, and Magneto, who would like to see, well, mutants wipe out the human population. And let's face it, if I was if I had the power of Magneto, the power of magnetism, which means you could pretty much snuff the life out of any human being because we have we have metals in our blood. Magneto could just, you know, go like this and take everyone out. I mean, the real question is, if you look at human history, if we had a more advanced form of humanoid on the planet, such as Homo Superior, who's to say that they shouldn't displace, uh, displace Homo sapiens the way that Neanderthals were displaced by Homo sapiens? I mean, I don't know. Um, I don't think... Just because you you call upon something to be allegorical doesn't mean that the, the the message of that allegory is negated by the fact that it's not complete completely one sided or not. Um, I, I think that it still works and I think it's still valid. I mean, ultimately, we're human beings reading fictional stories, and we get it. I mean, it's up to us as readers, astute readers, to understand what people are going for, and I don't think it undercuts the message. At all. I mean, I think it it can definitely. I mean, we know what the authors. When Claremont 
who basically shaped the modern X-Men, was he when he was writing Magneto, when he was writing Eric Lencher, or he's writing Charles Xavier. We we got it. We knew. I don't think the message was undercut. Uh, Jerome goes on to say, with movies and TV shows based on true stories and events, can sometimes be uh, can sometimes be disrespectful to the real people to change things or add fictional elements to the story. Hang on, let me read that one more time. Okay, with movies and TV shows based on true stories and events, can it sometimes be respectful to real people to change things or add fictional elements to the story? Um, I think that's a really good question. How much truth do you need to have before you might, in fact, be disrespectful? But see, but here's the thing. You know, Alfred Hitchcock once said that drama was life with all the dull bits cut out. And I think when you are inherently telling a story, the idea of a story, it is a literary form that has a beginning, a middle, and an end. You have characterization, you have inciting incidents, all of those things. People don't lead their lives like a literary version of a story. So by definition, in order to tell someone's life or explain an incident or some kind of historical fact or something, you have to then mold that narrative into a literary form or into a television show or a movie. So by definition, you're not transcribing actual history. You're turning actual history and events and life into a literary form, whether it's the form of a book or the form of a, a, a I say literature, movies are sort of a literature and or a television show, show, so they have to be changed. And you have to alter things to fit that form. I think, obviously, you want to try and be as truthful as you can be based on the reality of what actually happened. But by definition, you're going to have to change certain ways, certain things unfolded. You have to compress time. The event you might have been documenting might have taken place over 60 days. Well, if you want to have a two-hour movie, you have to com compress these events somehow. So I think as long as it it's in keeping with the spirit of the person or the events that you're documenting and you you are as truthful to those events as possible, that's all anybody can really ask because you're not watching something unfold in real time the way it actually happened. And unless you are, which is impossible because we didn't have equipment back then to capture things in that way, there's always going to be some kind of liberty taken, I think. Uh Naftali Cotter sends in a $20 tip. Naftali, thank you uh, for that. Do you think Vader told Second Sister that he captured Anakin and she used that information to try and draw out Obi-Wan? What do you think? Um, I don't necessarily... Look, I think Darth Vader is beyond lying to people about himself. But there's no reason for Vader to share information. I, I think that we're going to find out that... that uh, Reva knew Anakin was Vader because she was either there in the Jedi Temple when, I mean, we know she was there, but maybe saw Anakin or maybe he told her, you know, maybe for whatever reason he's trained her. He's took an interest in her from an, a young age, and we're going to find out that there is a Padawan relationship between the two of them. I don't think he would have to lie, but you never know. We will find out. Arjun A says, Hey, John or Rob, what are your thoughts on the Obi-Wan show's low audience rating on Rotten Tomatoes? I personally am shocked by it and feel that it must have something to do with review bombing. What are your thoughts? Well, maybe. I mean, fandom, you know, fandom spends time doing those kinds of crazy things, doing review bombing, which I think is strange. But, you know, I think that that here's the thing. Star Trek fans, Star Wars fans, Doctor Who fans, we all love these things. I mean, I've loved Star Trek since I was a little kid. Um, I expect Star Trek to always provide me with the kind of experience, the best experience possible. And, and when it doesn't, which is frequently as of late, um, I get upset about it. You know, and, and it's, hard, it's hard to reconcile the fact that I've been watching Star Trek for literally a half century. And when I'm getting new Star Trek that doesn't give me the same feeling as it did when I first saw it, I think people tend to 
get upset. And every time a new Star Wars show comes out, I think people expect it to be the greatest thing since sliced bread. They want the same feeling they got when they first saw Star Wars for the first time or first saw Empire Strikes Back. And they don't take into consideration the fact that, okay, it's a TV show. It's made on a limited budget. They're using different production technology. They don't have the same, you know, they're not shooting at Pinewood Studios. When you see Tatooine, they're not shooting in Tunisia like they did originally. So there's maybe a level of disappointment people feel. I think that, you know, they need to grade on a handicap. If you're a golf fan, for instance, you know how golf handicaps work. Some people are what are called scratch golfers, and um, they can play a course. They get par for the course. They're a scratch golfer. But some people, sometimes they shoot 8 over par, 10 over par, 25 over par, depending on your skill set, and you get a handicap there. I think people should learn to handicap the Star Wars shows that are made for Disney Plus because they're not made the same way as the Star Wars movies. So um, they shouldn't expect the same kind of return or feeling that a movie will give you. I mean, we talked about music earlier. They can't afford to get the London Symphony to record the entire soundtrack for each one of these shows. It would be way too expensive. So you kind of have to grade on a curve. That said, I think that, you know, there's the, the writing could be better. And I think that might have something to do with the lower audience scores. Now, I, uh, anybody that loves these shows, go with God. More power to you. Love what you love. Never let anybody tell you you shouldn't. The Undertaker sends in a tip. This is one of three. The Undertaker says, hi, John and Rob. Love the show. John, you repeatedly said the Marvel fake death universe. And I couldn't agree more, which makes Hugh Jackman's death in Logan that much more powerful. I'm torn because there's part of me that doesn't want him to do a cameo in the MCU because of Logan. There is also a part of me that wants Hugh to make a cameo just to put on the Wolverine costume. Also, my dream Marvel movie would be Hulk versus Wolverine, which would be Ruffalo versus Jackman, with the original Avengers on one side and the Fox X-Men on the other side. I get chills just thinking about it. Well, as somebody who's a lifelong X-Men fan, uh, I'd want to see an X-Men versus Avengers movie. I, I think that would be great. I love the, the comic series, and um, I have the omnibus. But, uh, you know, I, I mean, here's the thing. Hugh Jackman played Wolverine. It's been 22 years since he played Wolverine. We're coming down now to a quarter of a century he played Wolverine. And Ruffalo's Hulk is great, and I love Wolverine versus the Hulk. Um, but I think that kind of that time has passed and while I would love to have seen it I think we might get a different iteration of it depending on what the X-Men look like in the MCU look I love the Fox uh, X-Men universe I actually produced the special features for the X-Men 1.5 and the X2 DVDs back in the early days of the franchise and I, I dearly love those films but you know that time has passed it, re it really has and I, I think bringing Hugh Jackman back He's older now. He's not going to look as shredded as he looked in Wol in Logan. He, Wolverine was so shredded in Logan. It was amazing. So I think while I agree with you, I'd like to see those things. I don't think we're going to get them. And if we did get them, I don't think they'd be as satisfying as we might have hoped. And now, guess what? Today's mailbag was brought to you by our sponsor, Athletic Greens. Hey, guys. We want to take a second to thank the sponsor of this video, Athletic Greens. Now, when you get really busy, and you guys know that Ann and I are really busy, one of the first things you sacrifice is eating healthy. And you know, I simply have never eaten enough vegetables in my diet, I admit it. So for a long time, I've been looking for a really good all-in-one supplement that helps me get those nutrients and vitamins that my body needs. And thank goodness, I found Athletic Greens AG1. So what is Athletic Greens AG1? Well, with one delicious scoop of AG1, you're absorbing 75 high-quality vitamins, minerals, whole food source superfoods, and probiotics to help you start your day right. And for me and Ann, it's easy. We get up in the morning, 
morning, we pour a big glass of water and add one scoop of AG1. So many people today are taking some kind of multivitamin, and it's important to choose one with high quality ingredients that your body will actually absorb. And it's cheaper than getting all those different supplements yourself. And on top of giving you all those vitamins and nutrients, it also supports better sleep and quality of recovery and supports mental clarity and alertness. Right now, it's time to reclaim your health and arm your immune system with convenient daily nutrition. It's just one scoop and a cup of water every day. That's it. No need for a million different pills and supplements to look out for your health. And to make it easy, Athletic Greens is going to give you a free one-year supply of immune-supporting vitamin D and five free travel packs with your first purchase. All you have to do is visit athleticgreens.com slash mailbag. Again, that's athleticgreens.com slash mailbag to take ownership over your health and pick up the ultimate daily nutritional insurance. And a special thanks to our sponsor, Athletic Greens. If you're like myself or John, you probably hate vegetables too. Actually, probably some of you, I get a lot. A lot of you probably actually, fuck it, let me start over. Okay, fuck it. Sorry. <laughs> and, <clears throat> and a very special thanks to our sponsor, Athletic Greens. If you dislike vegetables as much as John and I do, let me tell you, Athletic Greens is a great way to get your veggies without having to eat them. You drink them instead. What's next? Uh, Jonathan Namella sends in a tip and says, John Rob. I love your pitch for Con Air 2, but John, Cyrus the Virus' death scene was the most epic part of the movie, so no, I respectfully disagree with you that Cyrus needs to stay dead. Rob, work on that pitch, and he tells it to Nick Cage, and bring on the filthy. Well, let me just tell you, Jonathan, if I'm ever in a room with Nicolas Cage, I'm going to bring you up, and I'm going to say, Jonathan said to pitch you this, Mr. Cage, and I think we should do Con Air 2. I think Cyrus the Virus comes back. I think I write and direct, and we all make a lot of money. But I'll be sure and drop your name. And I'm sure Nicholas Cage will be like, Rob, that sounds great, man. It'll be fantastic. And there we go. Cyrus the Virus, the return of Cyrus the Virus. Uh, Sandhorse says, thanks to Rob for the recommendation of Die Hard on 4K Blu-ray. Am I right or what? It looked fantastic, and I noticed lots of small details despite having seen the film many times before. Well, Sanders, it really, it really uh, warms my dark heart to hear you say that because, you know, I I'm a big fan, obviously, of physical media. And 4K, the 4K format is the end of the physical media format as far as I'm concerned. I don't think we're going to get 6 or 8K discs. I think we're done. So when I see photochemical movies, that means movies that are actually shot on film, and they go back and they pull out all the stops and give us a true 4K scan of the original negative, and they can color correct, we're getting movies the way we'd never seen them before. Die Hard was always a very difficult film to transfer to home video. Frankly, it never looked that great because of a lot of like, like the sun was setting over Nakatomi Plaza. The filtering, Jan de Bont, the DP used, and the, that golden hour, magic hour light coming through the windows, and then the anamorphic photography with the lens flares, and he used a lot of filtering and things. It was always, the color was never solid, a lot of reds and oranges and blues, and it would bleed all over the place. The, the, the 4K version is the first time the film has looked correct. And if you're a diehard fan, it is a must own. I'm glad you feel that way. I'm glad you got the disc. And I'm glad, once again, I prove that I'm always right. That's always nice to hear. Scott Brown, one of three. Uh, to me, Marvel has some problems that need to be fixed. One, they're spread too thin, so quality has suffered in phase four. Two, they need to establish rules for the multiverse because right now they have three different uh, versions, time, dimension, and quantum. Are they the same? Why do some variants look the same and some don't? And how do the versions impact each other? And with so many titles, you get left with open endings with huge consequences like Loki, Eternals, Doctor Strange 2, Shang-Chi, Moon Knight, and there's no clue when these questions will get answered and how these endings affect the overall MCU. The timeline is getting messy, Five, I'm getting bored of the multiverse. And six, with so many powered characters in one area of New York, it's becoming stale and uninteresting. It's no longer special. Scott, 
I couldn't agree with you more. Great minds think alike here. Um, as with any great science fiction fantasy or horror story, you need to define the rules of your universe because the rules allow us as viewers to anticipate various things in the stories themselves and the anticipation of things like when you're watching a mystery you're asking yourself who did it is it this character is it this character is it this character and based on the information that's provided to you you're able to make educated guesses and as the plot unfolds your guesses are proven right or wrong and that's what keeps your interest and in the case of like for instance i'm a hellraiser fan and you know if you've seen the hellraiser movies when the cenobites the the denizens from hell come up to torment a mortal it's because that mortal has opened up the lament configuration the the rubik's cube from hell that everybody has in the hellraiser movies they don't just show up and give you a hard time you have to summon them and in the marvel cinematic universe you've got loki with the sacred timeline well do all those branches happen in the same universe or are new universes created what happens in the quantum realm are they one and the same um, and I think you're right. We don't know. And when we don't know, it all becomes a nebulous blur. And that's when you tune out. If you don't have an understanding of what's happening and things are just happening willy nilly, then you're not able to anticipate. You're not able to ground yourself or to orient yourself within the story that's being told. And that's when you tune out. That's when you start going, ah, I don't know. Now, the idea that a lot of these superheroes live in New York City, that's always been a problem with Marvel in general. You know, because the creators, Marvel was based in, in New York City for most of its existence as a comic book company. So it's it's tough. I mean, everybody, you know, and let's face it, America has a lot of great cities. I love New Orleans. Miami's fun. Chicago's great. But Manhattan is kind of the center of the universe. I mean, even as a Los Angelino who's lived here now for 34 years, I would never tell you that Los Angeles is cooler than New York. It's not. It's different, but it's not as cool. So I get what you're saying. But... You know, I want to know about the cosmology as well of the Marvel Cinematic Universe. Like, if you've got a celestial cracking its way out of the center of the Earth and freezes in the middle of the ocean, I mean, is that not is that a tourist attraction? Are archaeologists and scientists going there? How does that affect the cosmology and the belief systems in our world? If you can see ancient Egyptian gods fighting over the Great Pyramids, or you see a celestial of Arsham the Judge comes back and is in the skies over the UK... If you're like a, a, a God-fearing Christian soul, what do you think about all this? I mean, this is not part of what you've been taught when you were growing up. I mean, when you go to church and you, you go to your pastor, you go to your priest, or if you're Jewish, you go to your rabbi and you're like, yo, what is up with these giant cosmic entities coming to earth? Where are we at? Like, what do I believe? I don't know. And I think they really need to address it because like you, it's becoming a little tiresome not knowing where we're at as far as the universe is going. I mean, already we already survived five years of being blipped. So I think you're absolutely right. I think they need to define more of this. I think we're going to get some kind of definition in quantum mania because it's called quantum mania. Uh, so I'm hoping at man of the wasp quantum mania will answer some of these questions, fill in the things that we need filled in. But I think you're right. I, you know, maybe it's, it's a little thin, but I'm liking a lot of the stuff that's going on, but yes, I think that quality is always better than quantity. So we'll see where we're going. Um, no one's ever done this before. We're, Thor Love and Thunder will be the 29th MCU movie. That doesn't even include the TV shows. So that's that's an amazing run for any franchise. And if you look at the James Bond franchise, there's only been 25 official Bond movies, and only half of them are good to great. So eh, the batting average of the MCU is pretty good. So all things being equal, not so bad. Phil S. says, I think it would be helpful if the Star Wars shows on Disney Plus had five-minute in-depth discussions of the episodes by the creators like Game of Thrones did after the credits. I think this would help quell the criticisms by the fandom and at least give insight. Thoughts? Phil, I think it's a great idea. I think one of the problems that that we have, especially as lifelong fans of these uh, long-running venerable franchises like Doctor Who and Star Trek and Star Wars and take your pick any of the other I mean the Marvel characters have been around for decades as well is that the audience knows so much about all of these things I mean look I've watched Star Wars trivia battles you know on the internet between people and even John Campia has won 
a Star Wars trivia contest at Star Wars Celebration. So there's a lot of people that know a lot about Star Wars. And the thing is, the lore is is so well known that when things are happening, like people wonder, are they going to break canon? When I left you, I was but the learner. Now I am the master, only a master of evil, Darth. That's obviously from the original Star Wars. Does that mean that Obi-Wan confronting Vader in Obi-Wan Kenobi breaks canon? You know, Princess Leia, last time we saw Princess Leia talk to Obi-Wan Kenobi for the first time, you know, General Kenobi, years ago you fought with my father in the Clone Wars or whatever. Now he calls for your aid again. She doesn't say, hey, remember when we were on that planet and you rescued me from those kidnappers? So it's all, it's all, it's all craziness. But I think having the creators fill in some of those blanks is a great idea. I mean, they're doing that with Star Trek. Uh, Will Wheaton hosts the Ready Room where they have creators on to sort of explain themselves. I think Star Wars would go a long way if they did that. I don't know if they will, but I think that they should. Could be a good thing. I like the idea. I'm a fan. Garden Variety Vagabond, one of two. John and Rob, I know you have not liked the over-nostalgia of the rooster character, but I offer another psychological perspective. In the original Top Gun, the last time the son saw his father was wearing that shirt and sunglasses with the mustache while playing and singing that song. That was the last time that the world was right and just to him. He is stuck in that last moment that he was ever happy and pure. Garden Variety Vagabond, I think there's a lot of truth in what you say. And in my own mind, I kind of felt the same way. And in the movie, there is a photograph of that moment where you see young Rooster sitting on the piano while his father's playing with that shirt on and his mom. So you're absolutely correct. They make that correlation in the film. Um, it's it's right there in the text of the movie. Now, I don't know if that was the last time he was pure or that was the last time he was happy, but that would be the last memory of his father that he had. And it's probably very vivid to him. So it makes absolute psychological sense. I think you're 100% correct. And they do draw that parallel in the film. So you're not just pulling that uh, opinion out of your ass. That is a legit thing that you obviously notice in the film. I think that is a very astute reading of the movie itself. So well done to you, and I agree with you 100%. Great balls of fire. Garden Variety Vagamon goes on to say, Gents, on first cinema experiences, the first films I remember was finally getting to see Star Wars when it came to a second-run cinema that my parents could afford to bring me to. Also, drive-in double feature of Heaven Can Wait and the Cannonball Run. That is a great double feature. I love Heaven Can Wait. I mean, for those of you who haven't seen it, it's a great Warren Beatty movie. Uh, and, I, you know, I don't want to, obviously it has to do with the afterlife and perhaps somebody dying and becoming an angel. I don't want to get into it. But if you've never seen Heaven Can Wait, it's a great movie. And the Cannonball Run, what a classic from all of our childhood. Look, someone said to me, you can have Cannonball Run or you can have Goonies. Even though Cannonball Run isn't about kids, I would burn every print of Goonies and the negative and it would never be seen again. Cannonball Run, however, I would hoist it on a, on a platform and, and, and save it for the ages. So what a great double feature. My God, well done. Uh, fan of yours. Does that mean me or John or Rayora, maybe Jonathan? I mean, who's who are you a fan of? Fan of yours. I'm just going to assume it's me. Uh, hey, guys, great show today, Friday. Was wondering if you ever heard of these movies. Brown Up. Attack of the Killer Bromatoes. Father of the Bro. I love you, bro. And, of course, the bro Avengers. <laughs> Thanks. For the great content and bring on the filthy. Well, fan of yours, I want to say that since you're the first to once again resurrect this horrible thing that we're going to now have to deal with, uh, we're going to give you a great John Campy show. No prize, just like Marvel used to give to people their famous no prizes for bringing back the bro titles. I want to swim in your brotion. Thank you for doing that. Um, I don't know. I, you've, you've opened the floodgates. I take no responsibility. So, and that. Brings us to the end of the John Campion Mailbag for this Friday, June 3rd, 2022. I want to thank all of you for supporting the channel generously through your tips and your great questions. It gives us something to talk about, something for me to opine over, and you also support the channel while you do it. 
Remember, you can send more questions. I can't even say remember. You can uh, send questions in 24-7, seven days a week to the link right down below. And uh, if we deem your question appropriate, we might read it right here on the mailbag. I'm, of course, your host, Robert Meyer Burnett. You can find me on Instagram at Robert Meyer Burnett or just RM Burnett. And that means you'll be doing something that John Campia has never done because he doesn't follow me on Instagram, which means you can kind of be better than him because follow my great pictures and you can follow my life, which why shouldn't you want to? Find me on Twitter at Burnett RM or find me on my own website at postgeeksingularity.com or my Post Geek Singularity Facebook page. I want to thank producer Jonathan Voico and, of course, the man with the plan, Mr. Ray Ora, for observing me do this and being my audience. Can I get a round of applause? Thank you very much. And thank you.